。我们要特别邀请到的是来自于波兰华沙大学数学与计算建模和计算机交互科学中心的主任 ，Mr. m a d r i k m i h a l e v i c h 他来发表演讲。他的主讲题目是“连通性是人工智能的自然智能关键”。接下来，各位用你们热烈的掌声。欢迎我们从波兰远道而来的这位朋友，掌声有请。I state, and and this is my thesis,、uh, that the connectedness is the most critical aspect of both artificial and natural intelligence. And I'm very pleased. I didn't know about the tagline of the conference, where the second word is intelligence, connecting intelligence. So,、uh, spot on. And I will give you a shocking example of how important connectedness is. In human brain, maybe 50, 60 years ago, in the most advanced country in the world at the, at the time, in the United States, one of the preferred、uh, methods of curing a patient was killing the patient. So imagine now, what sort of medicine administers the course of treatment that immediately kills the patient? I'm talking here. About lobotomy, I believe all of you know what lobotomy is. It's separating left from、uh, right,、uh, left from right、uh, hemisphere of the brain, and during the process, fair enough, some、uh, patients got much much more quieter, but they ceased to be humans. They were biologically alive, but they were not. Human in the sense that was discussed so many times, and words like consciousness was mentioned many times in previous talks. What it means to be naturally intelligent? What what it is? General intelligence. So suddenly, by severing connections between one par part of brain and the other, we lose the human being. We lose the person that that thinks and perceives and plans for the future, and can can absorb reality. And similarly, we can th think. And、uh, I have to make some admissions. I'm not AI expert. I'm not a researcher in AI. I'm a theoretical physicist who happened to be working supercomputing. And I'm very grateful to Pro Professor Wing, who mentioned the life cycle of data, because I often talk about life cycle of data, but at a slightly different level. Whereas、uh, Professor Wing was talking about research being undertaken at each stage. You can associate certain infrastructure and equipment associated with each stage of life of data, and that's where my interests are. But not only, of course, I'm also interested in methods and algorithms and mathematics. But predominantly, if you talk about supercomputing, we are daily involved in thinking of optimal systems, using optimal processors, optimal memories, and so on. And here's a, here's a Something that I also want you to think about: we are very often projecting our understanding of brain and thinking from what little we know about computer architecture. And unfortunately, predominant computer architecture is CMOS-based, using transistors, and because of that, you, we use binary logic. And we use certain way of representing floating point numbers, and there are different ways. And and you can compute using non-binary systems. You can you can have、uh, quadruple systems and lots more. And all of this, and you can have analog computers, and you can have quantum computers, and each of those computers can perform optimization problems. So it just happens that we have、uh, GPUs that are extremely efficient in certain tasks. And thanks to that, we have meetings like today, where there is a huge expansion of of certain techniques and very successful techniques in artificial intelligence. I would like to tell you that、uh, that in supercomputing, 
uh, especially from my point of view, I've been running this com com conference called Supercomputing Frontiers, where the accent is on frontiers, in on the completely visionary ideas, thoughts, uh, very unorthodox. And in that respect, uh, I had fifth conference this year in Warsaw. I had visionaries like Leon Chua, who invented Memristo. You can read. I will be just giving pointers. And for good students, please go and s study those things like Memristo and non von Neumann architectures and in-memory computing for understanding of, uh, of AI and so forth. And, and here, I have several people who work, for example, on gut microbiome. I'll get back to that, that point. And, uh, and I will have a, a person like this. Uh, a uh, young German scientist who studies uh, connectome in brain and formation of cliques and identifies structure with function in the brain. And we talk about those topics in the context of supercomputing. And that's not only just uh, hardware or s application alone, but the gr grander visions. A couple of years ago, in the edition of conference in Singapore, we ran special session on topics that are being discussed today. So three years ago, we were already very concerned with things like supercomputers and superintelligence. Could the brain have ever have mind? And for that topic, I especially invited Baroness Susan Greenfield, who is not a computer scientist. And that was deliberate. I brought a neurophysiologist to tell computer scientists what the brain is from the biology point of view. Then uh, if we, I'm sorry for sort of drawing sort of lots of different ideas. It's a little bit eclectic, but please leave this, this hall with uh, remembering that, that certain crazy ideas takes tens of years. You know, sometimes you, you have to wait 20 years. I'll give you two examples. One example is that what do I have? Do I have anything in common with Elon Musk, a part that I'm human? Yes, he is working on electric car. I have invented nano car. Conceptually, I'm a theoretical physicist, so I work with ideas. I threw an idea over 22 years ago about building molecular size car. Remind you that Richard Feynman, in his famous paper, talked about micron size car. I talked about nano-scale car. I waited for eight years. I don't do things. I just think about things. And James, uh, uh, one of the great chemists, uh, in, uh, James Tour from Rice University, with his students, built the whole range of nano cars made of little molecules. Last year, we had the, or two years ago, there was the first world race of nano cars. So those things, although they are crazy, and I will show you another example, because I have also not only conceptualized the smallest car, but I have built the largest computer in the world. The computer that span the entire world. Not in the, in the sense of number of processors, but in the, in the sense of globally distributed concurrent system. And uh, one of the key issues there is connectivity. And then if you think about, I'll go back to AI here, if we want to use, to really apply AI in the best possible way, we should not be talking about, you know, recommendation of a restaurant. Do I go for Chinese or Korean tonight? That's a trivia. It's, it, don't tell me this is AI. But we have very important issues like distribution of wealth, distribution of resources, lack of resources. In some things, we will be running out of lithium, perhaps, or some other elements, and we have to reuse uh, uh, what we have. So we have to apply, in the best possible way, what, we, what sort of methods and tools we have today. And uh, now about things like uh, gerrymandering. Uh, this is part of democratic process. It can very seriously influence the, the outcome of uh, elections. And again, by fiddling with the boundaries, electoral boundaries, you can completely change the result of democratic process. And this sort of thing has got nothing to do with, you know, it has got to do with, with distribution of population of particular kind. You can stop it or you can sort of 
make sure that it's, it's properly done by using computation, supercomputer, and AI. Now I would like to, 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 to draw your attention to something very important. We very often talk about brain, and we have this concept that brain is something that's localized in here. Actually, we are driven by our guts, and, and gut microbiome actually determines how we behave very often. When we're hungry, we do certain sometimes silly things just because our gut. So it's not the brain driving us. So our sort of consciousness is much more complex, and that, of course, can be described by networks and by, gra by graphs. And, of course, we have sensors, we have non-Feynman non non Neumann architectures. Here I draw, I give you some, some links or sort of pointers to the, in my mind, the most interesting and the most fundamental papers that appear recently about cliques and cavities in human connectome, and also cliques of neurons bound into cavities. Those sort of things will tell you that actually architecture of brain is not addressable memory. Actually, our brain is nothing like computer. Actually, I can ask you, where is the software in our brain? There's no software. There's only hardware and wetware. And actually, hardware and the way how, how the brain is connected, that's your thoughts. That's your memory. So you could test it with functional brain scans and see, for example, if you s express, you say were, were the dog in one language and another and another and another, it, does it correspond to the same region of the brain or the same path of the brain? Because the paths are everything. So here I will go to Infinicortex, the largest computer in the world. We started in 2014, first across Pacific, first time that we had 100 gigabits per second across Pacific uh, fiber and used uh, successfully. Next year, we had circumventing around the globe connection. Mind you, this is not internet. It was InfiniBand, which, with which you can realize RDMA. That means I can directly access memory of another computer on another part of the world without asking operating system. That's something very specific. The year after that, we had, we had this, plus we have introduced the routing in seven places around the world with subnets. That was rather complex topology. And here is this, this lobotomy. We cut somewhere across, and I've been studying topology of interconnects for supercomputers. And here, the question is about the rerouting of what happens if you just lose certain links. And then I've, I encourage you in your AI research, do the same thing. Try cutting some of the links. Try cutting it across different planes and see what happens. Do the lob lobotomy in a virtual lab. Here is something very neat, because on the basis of this infrastructure, which we call InfiniCortex, we built InfiniCloud. That means with the, with the push of the button, we can fire virtual cloud in four continents doing job, and here you have uh, statistics from different countries, Australia, Singapore, Europe, uh, and the USA. And we have actually used ver very useful applications. We have had cancer mutation calling pipeline performing on those, on those computers, and that is concurrent computer. That means a single computer with memory accessible by each component, each uh, processor to each other part, working at the same time on the same problem, usually doing these workflows. Here's a demo of a program which is, simulates a thermonuclear reaction, done, uh, work done by Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Here's a very interesting thing about the pathology samples, cellular structure, and annotation for, for the cancer features done by uh, Taksin Kurz at Stony Brook University. We've done performance on up to 18 GPUs. So we can, you can have GPU cards in one place, and so your performance uh, compute somewhere else and data somewhere else. And the, the issue is that even what Professor Wing has uh, shown and, and the previous Professor Chow, that uh, you have a doctor somewhere, and you have Illumina machine, you can have introduced personalized medicine. How do you do it? The, the volume of data for genomic uh, research is of the order of uh, terabytes. How, how do you sort of, you, you don't buy supercomputer at every hospital. But with this sort of technology we have shown with very fast tra transportation of data, 
we shoved the data from Canberra in Australia across Pacific and back to Singapore instead of using 13 and a half hours in 28 minutes. So that is the time the doctor sits at the side of the patient, less than 30 minutes. So you can shove the data across the world, wherever. And here the lesson is that you have fantastic supercomputers, national supercomputer centers in, 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 in China, in Tianjin, Shenzhen, in Guangzhou, in Beijing, all over the place. What you could also do is to connect them in the way that you build one federated supercomputer for all of China. So if you need it for the most humongous and most ambitious tasks beyond anything that we know today, you could use that infrastructure with appropriate programming models. And uh, here's just uh, a little bit about my uh, research institute. By the way, we, we do work on computer vision, image uh, processing, AI in the medical field, uh, AI and data in, the, in legal uh, course proceedings and open access to scientific publications who work on on modeling of uh, flights around the world. Uh, we have special relationship with ICAO, uh, International Civil Aviation Authority, so we have access to some like billions of records for every single flight around the world from every airfield, for every plane, and we can model, for example, distribution of optimal landing points or routes or rerouting. We do for the last 22 years weather modeling for, for Central Europe one of the most accurate based on uh, UK uh, model, unified model. We do a lot of things, so I invite of all of you to maybe uh, acquaint yourself with, with what we do or talk to me, and I'll be very happy to engage in further uh, collaborations or discussions or work. Thank you very much.